and get that going. And I think that's all I need to do. I'm going to leave everybody unmuted. So you can kind of mute or unmute yourself um, if you uh, yeah, want to uh, ask a question or say anything. So anyway, all right. Well, um, happy June if you're not floating away or <laughs> uh, yeah, digging out, uh, paddling out from being underwater. My goodness, another big rain last night. Um, anyway, this is our um, actually uh, final webinar of this fiscal year and uh, wrapping up the series that we've been doing on the um, evidence behind the 10 steps. So as I, whoops, get my mouse working. As we get going here, just to always have a disclosure slide, I don't have any financial interest. Um, and this is uh, uh, the webinars that we do are part of our Becoming Baby Friendly in Oklahoma project, which is funded um, by a Title V federal grant to our maternal child health uh, service at the Oklahoma State Department of Health. So they contract with us to um, uh, oversee this project. Um, and of course, that's my grandson, who uh, he was about 10 months old, I think, in this picture. He's 11 months old now and walking. So he's doing, yeah, very, very proud grandparents. And one more person in. Yes, thank you. And uh, of course, that's our uh, OBRC team, myself, and then Petra, Sarah, who's here in the office with me, and then Amanda, who uh, works part-time uh, helping with managing our uh, outpatient lactation clinic as a provider there. And then we haven't, uh, I realized recently we had never had a picture of our hotline team. So this is everybody who's on the hotline. Um, Cindy Garcia, who is bilingual and is in this uh, area. Jamie Provine, Cassidy Hotz, who's also in the Tulsa area. Apollo, who we just recognized at the summit and has just recently retired. She was one of our original hotline LCs. Carrie Hale, who many of you know also from the Milk Bank. Petra, of course, and then uh, Carissa, and then our newest uh, hotline LC, Jacqueline, who took uh, Paula's place. So continue to have a great team of um, IBCLCs there to provide that support. So um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, as a reminder, if you want to see any of our past webinars, because we do record them and make those available on our website, so you can click the link here, which uh, this um, um, PowerPoint, the slides from this will be sent out uh, soon after the webinar today and the recording and so forth as well, and those will all be available. Um, June is National Safety Month, and so I thought that was just a great uh, theme to tie in with our um, Baby Friendly Project, because just a reminder that Baby Friendly Practices definitely emphasize patient safety that always comes first. And if you want some other information on that, we've uh, talked uh, and addressed some safety issues in past presentations. So from the 2018 summit, the business case for Baby Friendly, one of the presentations that I gave, uh, we had some safety information at the end of that. And then the uh, March webinar that we did uh, addressing um, step seven and eight, <clears throat> excuse me, we uh, talked about a safety bundle that had been recently published uh, on rooming in. So you can certainly go back to those uh, uh, presentations. And uh, teaching formula feeding parents how to safely prepare those formula feedings uh, is also one of the uh, baby friendly practices to uh, uh, train staff on and make sure you have adequate or accurate information for families. Um, and then last but not least, and some of you have probably felt like you've gotten bombarded by emails, <laughs> but um, for whatever reason, the MPINC survey that the CDC uh, uh, has out in the field, they've, it's, I, they've just had challenges with this uh, administration of this survey. And I know several of you have contacted us about some challenges you've had with getting your survey submitted. So um, the deadline uh, for completing the survey is June 28th. And I was just at the US Breastfeeding uh, Committee uh, meeting and conference last week in DC and the CDC people were there and actually gave me personally a list of three hospitals that they were 
never able to make any contact with. So those hospitals have been notified with all the contacts that we had, and uh, but they cannot, uh, part of the protocol is they cannot tell me which hospitals had successfully submitted a survey or the opposite of that, which hospitals they had not gotten a survey from that they had contacted. So I had asked for that, but that's, that's they're not allowed to give that. So if you're not sure, uh, email, here's the email, cdcmpinksurvey at battelle.org. You can contact them directly to find out if your hospital survey was submitted. And if not, you still have time for them to uh, send that to you and get that completed. So, um, Anyway, all right, so let's wrap up this series on the evidence behind uh, the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. And we are on steps nine and 10, which are kind of uh, uh, colloquially pacifiers and community support. Don't you just love all those cute little colorful pacifiers? <laughs> just looks like candy or something, I don't know. So anyway, uh, those are the references um, that will be, that have been cited in this presentation and of course starting with the Baby Friendly USA guidelines and evaluation criteria that came out in 2016 and they made a slight tweak in 2018 which particularly applies to uh, uh, step nine and then of course the World Health Organization um, uh, publication which is what um, prompted this series. So a few uh, reminders, we've said this at the beginning of each of these as we look at the Baby Friendly USA guidelines and evaluation criteria, a few key tenants, uh, important points that they want to make as a kind of an overview of the Baby Friendly Hospital initiative, that breastfeeding um, has been recognized um, scientifically, research-based, as the optimal method of infant feeding, so that should be promoted as the norm, uh, and the most um, uh, sound and effective approaches to supporting breastfeeding and lactation in the birthing environment that we, that we have scientific literature to support. That's what we should be following um, uh, in each health care facility. So whatever scientific evidence there is at this point in time. And as you know, uh, in this area, sometimes you know, we don't always have as much information or um, evidence as we would like. Anyway, um, but also some other key points and um, the healthcare delivery environment should not be restrictive or punitive. It's not about punishing mothers or making mothers do something that they don't want to do. We want to support every mother, every family to make informed healthcare decisions. And that environment should be sensitive to cultural and social diversity, which sometimes is, I know, a challenge. And that, um, that the final tenant here is that um, the family should be protected when they're in our environment, in our hospital, in our clinic, um, but particularly in this case, in our birthing hospital, that we're the objective evidence-based environment. And so we are not allowing any kind of product promotion that's gonna interfere or undermine uh, the families making informed choices. Okay. So uh, once again, this uh, series has been um, predicated on reviewing the um, publication from the World Health Organization that came out in 2017. And for those of you that may search for this online, um, of course they gave it the same name <laughs> as their um, uh, publication on the 10 steps and implementing the 10 steps. Uh, I'm not sure who had the great idea to give them the same name and totally confuse everyone, but this one is particularly the review of the evidence at the time. So this was published in 2017. So, um, you know, give them a year or more. Uh, so you're probably looking at, you know, research that was published, you know, through maybe 2016 at the latest. Um, anyway, the target audience, of course, policy policymakers, expert advisors, um, other you know, institutions that are doing some kind of programs uh, on infant and young child feeding that could be health departments, uh, you know, federal governments, uh, and so forth, and also can be used by healthcare professionals and universities to disseminate information as um, we are doing here. So, okay, so we're gonna look at steps nine and 10, and once again, the way I kind of have this uh, organized is we'll, we'll go through, um, Step nine, and what does the WHO 
uh, review say and uh, what do the baby friendly guidelines say as far as you know what that step is what other um, evidence may have come out since that WHO publication and then we'll do the same thing with step 10 and then we'll look at the end at uh, what are maybe the barriers um, and how do we overcome some of the barriers to implementing these two steps. So uh, in a nutshell, step nine says give, no, and this is copied straight out of Baby Friendly USA, uh, give no pacifiers or artificial nipples to breastfeeding infants. Um, we could give it to mom if we want. <laughs> I thought that was a fun picture. Anyway, so, um, so straight out of Baby Friendly USA guidelines uh, and evaluation criteria, Healthcare professionals, including nursery staff, should educate all mothers about how the use of bottles and artificial nipples may interfere with the development of optimal breastfeeding. Uh, so we're not saying uh, pacifiers uh, are, or bottle nipples are evil um, things and should never ever be used, but how the use of those may interfere with that initiation or that development of optimal breastfeeding. And any fluid supplementation, if it's medically indicated or the mother's choice, um, should preferably be given by something other than an artificial nipple or bottle. Uh, so what do we do when a mother requests um, that her, so there's this kind of a, um, there's a, uh, nine uh, bullet points 9.1 in the guidelines and then 9.2 which specifically talking about bottles so when mom requests that her baby be given a bottle this is what uh, we should do we should try to explore why she's asking uh, address any concerns she's raised educate her on the possible consequences um, to successful or optimal breastfeeding and discuss alternative methods uh, for soothing or feeding her infant. If she still requests a bottle, then of course we document that we've counseled and educated her so that she is making an informed decision and we can uh, verify that. So uh, 9.2 is kind of really saying the same thing about pacifiers. Uh, the, pass the use of pacifiers may interfere with the development of optimal breastfeeding. And then an additional point they added, um, and this has been in there, but a little different from you know, um, use of uh, nipples and bottles, is that um, they shouldn't be given a pacifier by staff with the exception of, of course, painful procedures when the baby can't be you know, safely held or breastfed, and that pacifier should be discarded after um, that procedure. Of course, um, circumcision would be the first one on that list. Uh, if it's a baby who's being uh, gavage fed in the NICU, of course, and then other rare specific um, medical reasons. Um, and it could be, you know, in some facilities, maybe it's a, a baby that's in DHS custody or, you know, um, that, you know, we don't have, you know, a mother that's actually nursing the baby. Um, and anyway, after all of that, if mom still requests a pacifier, the process of counseling uh, and education should be documented. So, um, and the same thing as with the bottle, if she requests a pacifier, explore the reasons, address concerns, educate on consequences, and um, discuss alternative uh, methods for soothing and feeding her infant. And, okay, so step nine, avoiding uh, pacifiers and artificial nipples. And I have to be honest, um, and y'all stop me anytime if you wanna um, ask a question, raise your hand, unmute yourself or something, feel free to, um, and uh, to uh, yeah, say something, but um, I, I really um, struggled <laughs> with sorting through what seemed to me some double speak on the part of WHO in their um, in their um, review of the guidelines. So uh, so I did my best to try to kind of parse it out, synthesize it, and um, summarize it uh, for y'all. Uh, but it was um, it was tricky uh, for this one and. Uh, anyway, so um, as with the other um, steps that we've gone through, the, the WHO's review of the evidence, they kind of took the 10 steps and split them into, kind of grouped them into three categories. One was um, creating an enabling environment, and that's, so we've covered that a bit with like step one on policy, 
step two on staff training, prenatal education, and step 10 uh, will fall under that as well. Then there's um, the steps that are about to provide immediate support. So there's your you know, step four, um, and skin to skin and early initiation and step five and so forth. And then the others feeding practices and additional needs. So there's kind of that rooming in, feed on cue, uh, and then, you know, what about this pacifier artificial nipple thing? So that kind of comes under that um, category. So the question, the research question they asked, should infants not be allowed to use pacifiers or dummies, as it's um, called in other countries, compared to allowing use of pacifiers or dummies in order to increase rates of exclusive breastfeeding during the stay at the facility? And then you see the PICO, they have it um, in that uh, PICO uh, category, um, kind of grouping, if you will. So this was the tricky part. <laughs> I uh, go through the, uh, uh, the one uh, review that they cited. Um, they um, uh, usually come back, Lord have mercy, do not stop my computer right now. Um, okay. Um, so uh, anyway, the, and then they, they usually just, um, I can find it in there where they've you know, summarized and then they just kind of restate the step or the question. But in this instance, they didn't. They kind of reworded it and what they said and uh, instead of um, what does the evidence say about restricting, you know, or not using pacifiers, they said mothers should be supported to recognize their infant's cues for feeding closeness comfort and enabled to respond with a variety of options during their stay at the facility. And so when they worded it that way, then they said they had high quality evidence to recommend that. Um, so to me, that was kind of double speak. And you know, like, does that mean that includes pacifiers or not? What are we saying here? Is that kind of under the variety of options, but maybe that's last on the list? <laughs> so, um, and so here's some additional um, language they had. Mothers can be supported to make informed decisions regarding the use of pacifiers and bottles and teats by ensuring they are aware of the slight risk of interfering with breastfeeding during these early days. So they did acknowledge um, that there was a risk. And, um, and yet the only um, review they had, it was um, a Cochrane review in 2016, and, um, and when they did their review at that time, there were only two randomized controlled trials that they could find um, on this question that uh, uh, included a total of about 1,300 healthy uh, term infants. So they also had kind of a subcategory where they were looking at preterm infants, but since Baby Friendly doesn't evaluate you know, babies in the NICU itself, um, you know, I, I chose not to uh, try to confuse the issue with that today. Uh, anyway, this Cochrane review found no significant effect on exclusive or partial breastfeeding at three and four months. But the, um, when you went in and actually looked at the actual trials, the studies they evaluated, they only included highly motivated mothers. So these were all mothers who were recruited to be in these studies um, and to give a pacifier, not give a pacifier. And uh, and they were all mothers who already had a strong goal to exclusively breastfeed for uh, some period of time. And so the other conclusion they drew was that the evidence to assess short-term breastfeeding difficulties uh, or long-term effect of pacifiers on uh, the baby's health is lacking. So kind of a, a mixed bag there, if you will. Um, <clears throat> but definitely, if you look at um, mothers who aren't as highly motivated or uh, a little more anxious about breastfeeding, you know, we could certainly see something. So the other interesting thing is while in most of this review, uh, the WHO, you know, only considered randomized controlled trials, for some reason in step nine, uh, they also looked at a couple of observational studies, which they hadn't done in any of the others. Uh, so I found that interesting, but they had two studies um, and then when they combined the two, it's almost 16,000 term infants and they were done in Poland and Switzerland. And um, these observational studies found that um, the babies who were not exclusively breastfed at discharge were significantly more likely to have used a pacifier 
They also looked at a Brazilian study of 450 mothers and made the point that um, the mothers who offered pacifiers to their infants tended to have more breastfeeding difficulties. They were more anxious and less confident. Uh, so I think that actually kind of uh, uh, aligns with the uh, uh, Cochrane review of the highly motivated mothers perhaps were able to uh, successfully use a pacifier early on and maybe not have any impact, but mothers who aren't as motivated or more anxious, less confident, um, that may not be the case. Um, so the second um, part of this question, of course, is more specifically looking at um, giving feedings, uh, any kind of supplemental feeding with a bottle and artificial nipples. So should infants who are or will be breastfed not be fed supplements with feeding bottles and teats, but only by cup, dropper, gavage, finger spoon, or other methods. <laughs> Goodness, they had a list. Um, other methods not involving artificial teats compared to using feeding bottles. Um, and once again, in order to increase rates of exclusive breastfeeding during the hospital stay. And they said in this, this is how they normally have the question and then say the overall quality of evidence was this step was still recommended uh, and moderate quality evidence. Um, so they you know, had kind of low, moderate, and um, So um, uh, they also went on to, um, oops, let's see, did somebody else, um, anybody else? Okay. Um, anyway, so they you know, went on to say that if express breast milk or other feeds are medically indicated, and we just once again looked at the term infants, um, use of feeding methods, methods such as cups, spoons, or what is this? Feeding bottles and teats may be used during their stay at the facility. So here we get a little more double speak again. Okay, are we supposed to do this or are we supposed to avoid this? Um, and they went on to say, but there should be no promotion of breast milk substitutes, feeding bottles, etc., cetera, um, in any part of the facilities and that health facilities and their staff should not give feeding bottles and other products within the scope of the uh, National code to breastfeeding infants. So, uh, so Becky's translation of here is um, they're actually looking at that marketing piece that we shouldn't be giving the formula uh, gift bags at discharge, sending a breastfeeding family home with you know a carton of um, formula. We shouldn't be you know wearing the badge reels or. Uh, stethoscopes or whatever that have you know formula company logos and things like that so I think this is kind of the marketing piece um, but you know when I go back to this uh, statement this kind of to me contraindicates what they uh, contradicts um, what they had just said here where the quality of evidence was you know still good for avoiding um, feeding bottles and teats so once again some double speak on this step um, and then um, the systematic review, this was not a Cochrane review, um, but it uh, was a systematic review looking at um, giving a, a, any supplemental feedings by uh, a bottle with artificial nipple. Um, this was in 2016. And this um, particular review, um, uh, and I'm sorry, I meant to go back and look at how many studies. They didn't have very many um, studies that they that qualified to be in this review, but they they said it probably makes little difference in breastfeeding a discharge and any or exclusive breastfeeding um, at two and six months. But but they said it was pretty low quality evidence. So I think we've gone around in circles on this. So so what else is out there? Is there other evidence um, that wasn't cited at the time by WHO or has been published since? Um, that we could look at. Uh, so once again, here are some more recent ones. This one um, published in 2017, association between in-hospital pacifier use and breastfeeding um, continuation and exclusivity. This was a nice um, uh, study with um, 37,000 mothers, and this came from the CDC's PRAMS uh, surveys in 10 states, so uh, certainly, yeah, representative across the country. They adjusted, of course, for demographics, and they adjusted for pro-breastfeeding or, if you will, baby-friendly hospital practices. 
And of course, they uh, found that past fire exposure during the birth hospitalization was independently associated with decreased odds of any and exclusive breastfeeding after 10 weeks. Um, and, and this did not um, include babies admitted to the NICU. Of course, that's they specifically um, said NICU admission was an effect uh, modifier. So not to uh, kind of go on the good, sir. Um, another one that just came out this year, factors in the hospital experience associated with postpartum breastfeeding success. Now this was interesting because um, this was a, a systematic sampling of um, almost 6,000 mothers from Utah from their PRAMS data. So these mothers were all about two, somewhere in the range of two to four months. Adjusted for hospital experiences, demographics, smoking, pregnancy complications, a couple of other things. And they found um, that there was a higher prevalence of terminating breastfeeding before two months or you know, premature weaning if they um, received a pacifier or were given formula or staff help with breastfeeding. Ooh. That's interesting. So hold that thought for a second. Um, and then um, in the other group, the um, mothers who fed only breast milk and received a phone number to call for help had lower prevalence of that premature weaning uh, before two months. So let's, let's go back to, so they had, if they got a pacifier formula or the staff helped them with breastfeeding, what? Um, then they were more likely to have stopped breastfeeding before two months. So what do we know about Utah? Well, Utah has the highest birth rate in the country. They have some of the highest overall breastfeeding rates. They tend to be in the top three to five states in uh, breast, overall breastfeeding rates. But at the time, and this just came out, they only had one baby-friendly hospital. So that means that uh, many of these mothers, or most of these mothers, were delivering in hospitals that continued to give formula uh, gift bags, of course gave pacifiers, and the staff would have little to no training on breastfeeding. So that's how we can um, explain the um, findings in this particular study. So really interesting there. Okay. So then let's look at um, uh, the other kind of piece of that, which is you know, giving any supplementary feeds by bottle. And this, uh, as I was looking through studies um, and the articles to uh, cite, one of them talked about um, cut feeding as an alternative method and said something about, you know, that you know, we've had studies on cut feeding for a long time. And I thought, I wonder what they mean by a long time. So I went and looked those up. They had a an article that was published in the journal Pediatrics in 1948, over 70 years ago, on cut feeding. <laughs> so I was uh, pretty tickled to see that. So this is not some, uh, yeah, new wild thing that the breastfeeding crazy people came up with in the past 10 years, um, that, that we've had studies and research on cut feeding for 70 years some odd years. So anyway, so that's a copy of you can actually <laughs> pull that up in PubMed and uh, Google it and so forth. Um, we're not going to talk about worry about that study. Anyway, um, so just to kind of give one, um, uh, one additional um, piece of evidence, because this was a really nice um, uh, feeding neonates by cup uh, study that was published in 2016. Because uh, a lot of people, you know, um, have concerns or um, aren't don't have the confidence to utilize cut feeding as we might uh, with bottle feeding, but it was a systematic review, and they had um, 28 studies uh, that they thought were well designed that they included in this review. Ten randomized controlled trials. This is one thing you can randomize when you look at a breastfeeding question. Uh, seven non-randomized. Uh, intervention studies and then 11 observational studies and they said overall cut feeding appears to be safe um, though we may have a little spillage so the intake might be a little less compared to a bottle or um, tube you know, gavage feeding and overall slightly higher proportions of cut fed versus bottle fed uh, infants that were doing any breastfeeding and a greater proportion of cut fed infants reported exclusive breastfeeding at discharge and beyond. And that's ultimately, of course, the outcome that we're interested in. So, um, 
All right, so I'm gonna pause there. So that was going through step nine, um, which was, yeah, as I said, quite challenging. We'll, uh, we'll still circle back around to, you know, what do we, what do Baby Friendly USA guidelines say? Um, but does anyone have any questions or anything um, before I move on to step 10? Where's my, where's my chat box? Oh, right there. So, oh good, we've got names in there too. Let's see if I see any questions in there. All right. All right, well, we will move on. Once again, stop me anytime. Um, so step 10, kind of what I call support after discharge, but the actual um, overall um, uh, language of step 10, foster the establishment of breastfeeding support groups and refer mothers to them on discharge from the hospital or birth center. Uh, so this was um, kind of interesting and uh, in what they looked at for this step. Um, so anyway, so straight out of Baby Friendly USA guidelines and evaluation criteria is um, the healthcare team should ensure before discharge that someone uh, explores with each mother and family um, or whatever support person if available, what are her plans for infant feeding after discharge? And that we should make sure they get information on the importance of exclusive breastfeeding for about six months. So we want to make sure they get information on that duration piece and that um, we have, um, we give them information about what's available in the community as far as support services without any ties to commercial interest. So we wouldn't wanna send them to a support group that's sponsored by a breast pump company. Um, because, you know, you could have something like that. Um, not just, you know, um, you know, formula industry and so forth. Uh, the other, um, uh, well, they gave examples. Um, you could give um, name and phone numbers of any kind of support groups, uh, other breastfeeding support services, maybe, you know, WIC care counselors in your area or something, a telephone helpline. Of course, we have our Oklahoma breastfeeding hotline. Are there any outpatient lactation clinics? Uh, our services in the area, home health services, and that's um, the uh, State Health Department WIC services lactation resource guide that they publish online and try to update a couple times a year. They include um, IBCLCs that may do home visits, for example, so knowing, checking that out and knowing what's in your um, area. And then, you know, any other individualized resource persons, and I've tried to think of what might fall in that category. Well, maybe uh, you're a smaller hospital and you're sending somebody home at 24 hours who uh, may have uh, ankyloglossia or a tongue tie and they need to be referred to someone in the community that can evaluate that. Uh, so that could be an example of something more special. Um, and also under this um, uh, guideline, early follow-up appointment with their pediatric provider and the facility um, doesn't typically have to have their own breastfeeding support services, but if there's nothing available in the community, um, then the facility should do what they can to have something that they offer. You know, whether it's a lactation clinic or they host a support group or, or something of that nature. So, um, but if there are resources available in the community, then get that information to the mothers. What did the WHO review? Uh, so the question, and this once again comes under that category of creating an enabling environment. So should mothers giving birth in hospitals or facilities providing maternity and newborn services be given linkage to continuing breastfeeding support after discharge compared to not um, and uh, in order to in increase rates of exclusive breastfeeding at one month? Now they put a time frame in here. And their overall um, summary was that um, uh, this step was still recommended and it was um, low quality evidence available at the time to support that. And they did go on to say that as part of um, you know, protecting uh, and promoting breastfeeding, discharge from facilities should be planned for and coordinated so that families have access to 
ongoing support. So it doesn't say that the facilities have to provide that, but that they make sure the families have access to some kind of support um, after discharge. So what did they look at? And um, they had um, a systematic review, uh, it was not a Cochrane review, but it was another systematic review that included two studies, one done in the Congo and one in Australia. And this was the, this was the really interesting piece, was they only evaluated the linkage. Did they give the mothers that information, not did the mothers actually utilize any of those support services? And so, of course, they're, if you're just going to look at the linkage, um, then their overall quality of the evidence, you know, was, was low. It still was supportive, but it was um, not as high as some of the other steps. So what else do we know? Is there other evidence, of course, um, that we might uh, look at? Well, um, a publication that I've cited more than once in some of these um, uh, other webinars relating to some of the other steps is from our U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC, as the acronym. And uh, this was a great publication looking at um, breastfeeding programs and policies and uptake. The comparative, um, uh, comparative effectiveness uh, review that came out. And I'm not gonna, it was a very lengthy publication. I'm just once again kind of highlighting a couple of uh, pieces here. But they once again overall found that the uh, Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative um, is associated with uh, improved rates of initiation and duration. And then here, let's see if I can do my pointer thingy. Um, that healthcare staff education combined, oh, that didn't cover again. Let me go back here. Um, combined with postpartum home visits may be effective for increasing uh, duration. And healthcare staff education alone with no additional breastfeeding support may not be effective um, for increasing breastfeeding initiation rates. Um, it well, should in duration too. So, so that, there's some data in that one. And then another study that we've cited before, Perez Escamilla's um, really nice systematic review on impact of baby-friendly hospital on um, breastfeeding and child health outcomes. And this was in uh, numerous countries around the world. Uh, 19 countries they included they evaluated over 800 studies and they included 58 in the final review that was published and um, they found of course a dose response relationship between the 10 steps that women are exposed to and improve breastfeeding outcomes so the more steps of course the greater the impact and they uh, once again made the point that the step 10 appears to be essential for sustaining those positive impacts in the longer term. Uh, so that's a, a key point out of there. Um, and then, uh, as I've said before, you know, they had um, several articles that reported um, the challenge of uh, uh, adhering to step six, um, the exclusive breastfeeding, and that was a major risk factor for poor outcomes overall. So, all right, so now uh, I'm gonna pause there once again and see any questions before we move into kind of the final section here talking about overcoming barriers? Um, any, uh, any questions? Or if anybody, yeah, no. I'll be asking y'all here anyway. Um, okay, so, uh, so once again, looking at how do we, you know, what are some of the common barriers and strategies and this is from um, the uh, publication Overcoming Barriers to Implementing the 10 Steps that came out in 2004. Uh, but I think the um, uh, barriers they identified uh, are still very relevant um, today, sadly, 15 years later. <laughs> so, uh, so some common barriers for step nine, of course, pacifiers and artificial nipples. The cultural expectation that we, the only way to calm a baby is with a pacifier. And I think we all know there's numerous other ways to calm um, a fussy baby. Uh, staff familiarity with bottles as supplemental feeding and then discomfort with alternative feeding methods and probably, yeah, and that of course leads into concern about the safety of pet feeding. Well, pet feeding now has been around as we know for quite some time and quite a bit of 
uh, studies and you know several Cochrane reviews um, on cup feeding. So, so safety should not be a, a concern there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So what are some of the strategies? They suggested, of course, um, look at recent research on the impact of other you know, feeding methods. Well, once again, cut feeding is the one um, that we have the most uh, uh, evidence to support. And, uh, and then recent research on, um, of course, association with pacifiers. So we've just done some of that. And can we translate that um, into uh, information for staff and physicians? As so one of the things um, I think, and we could probably do a whole separate webinar on this, is just having the conversation with the mother. Because if we're supposed to go into the room and she's asking for, you know, pick one, pacifier or bottle, a formula, you know, how do we have that conversation? How do we explore the reasons and not, you know, oh, we're baby friendly, you can't have any. Um, how do we uh, carefully, tactfully, sensitively, um, you know, try to find out what's going on. And that's what I'll say in trainings too, is just ask that open-ended question of, you know, mom says, you know, hey, can you bring me, I need a pacifier, you know, say, hey, what's going on? What makes you, what makes you think you need to give a pacifier? And Whatever she gets, you can have a list of reasons. I don't have enough milk. My baby wants to nurse all the time. I'm too tired, you know, whatever, uh, so that you can address whatever specific concern. That's that three-step counseling. Um, yeah, you know, I can see why you think that, or I can see why you'd be worried about that. It's normal for babies to feed frequently. Um, and, you know, you know, we're here to help you. You know, pacifiers can make breastfeeding harder. Here's what might happen, and we don't want to make things harder for you. Um, you know, why don't you call me when the baby's going to feed again so I can show you how to tell that he or she's getting enough milk or let's check the latch or let's have dad do some skin to skin, you know, whatever, depending on, you know, what issue she brings up. So, uh, so maybe I think with, um, these are some of the, I think that's why step nine is so challenging and maybe controversial too, is that it's just hard, um, uh, it can be hard to navigate um, and know how to handle that. So without feeling like we're judging or shaming or guilting or you know whatever and telling the mom, no, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> how, do we, how do we provide that education um, in a critical window of time when she's tired or frustrated or two o'clock in the morning? Um, so anyway, so I'm gonna pause there specifically on step nine um, and ask if anybody uh, that's on the call today um, wants to tell us, you know, what's worked for your hospital? Is this is this particular step still a challenge, um, or is it one that you feel like you've um, been able to work through and and nobody cares anymore? Nobody asks for pacifiers. And if everybody stays quiet in cyberspace, I'm gonna call on you. <laughs> so, uh, so who's on there today? And I see Christy and Charlie and Shawnee. I know y'all are uh, working hard. Anybody have a, um, how's this step going with y'all? I think that past fires are fine. Um, I think we had some initial kickback on it, but lately it's not been too bad. Parents either bring them with them or, um, and then we just go over it with them. But past mm -hmm. fires aren't hard. I think it's just other things that are a challenge right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a question for you, Becky, because this is something that um, we've been talking about lately because we're going to be moving into designation, request for designation sometime in August. Um, yeah, yeah. Our our, I, I don't know, we have lots of challenges, but so our nurses go in and they educate the moms when they ask for a bottle at two o'clock in the morning and they educate them. If we've educated the mom once, you know, and is it, I mean, we're going with they've been educated once. It doesn't mean that every nurse that goes in there needs to educate them about it. Now, if I go in and talk to them after the nurses have struggled all night, I just kind of go in and explain, kind of reiterate and try to back the nurses up to let them know that, you know, this is your choice, it's okay. But I also don't want 
the patients to feel bad and I don't want the staff to feel like they're getting in trouble. I mean, right. No, you, every time she asks for a bot, you don't have to do it 10 times in a row. Okay. The, the, so the, the question or the issue would be, um, uh, it was the first que the first uh, request was at two o'clock in the morning and we talked to her and offered this, that, and the other, and she still said, bring me some formula. Did they document it? Right. If it got documented, you know, then you're good. And right. if an opportunity arises, all things seem better during the day, <laughs> uh, that somebody, you know, has an opportunity, you know, or, you know, once if she asks questions, or whatever, um, then you know, fine, take that opportunity. But it's every single time you go into the room, you have to go through that again and document. Right. But it's, but just making sure does do the other nurses know that that actually got documented? Okay. Did somebody say no? I talked to her about that. It's like yeah, but if I go look in the computer because you don't want to have to take time to do that either. You know, did you check the little box? Yes. Okay. We're good. You just want to make sure that because people say that, you know, they did and they didn't. And then like then nobody did. Right. That's the thing. So one time. Yes. One time. And we talked about in our task force meeting about moms being able to have an option. I mean, they have options. They just need to be educated. And that's apparently our, some of our mothers feel like they don't have the option to bottle feed or whatever. So providing them with the education and giving them options and just being supportive is something that I guess we need to work on. Yeah. And, and I mean, they have the option to leave AMA. Do we want them to do that? <laughs> no, but they have the option to give their baby a bottle of formula when they say they want to breastfeed. And do we want them to do that? No. So do we, do we educate them about how that's going to, that can make breastfeeding harder, that can have, you know, create problems with your milk supply, you know, so just making sure does the mother understand the potential impact. Um, right. And if she does, and we, edu we educated and we documented, then, you know, we, you did your job. You did all you can do, and we're not going to harass her. You know, right. you're giving formula, we told you. No, you're not going to, you're not going to do that. Um, once again, unless just during the day or some other time period, you know, she's rethinking and asking questions, you know, let's revisit this, you know, um, we can help you and let's see how your baby's latching. And so you can always, you know, jump on those opportunities if they arise, but it's, um, yeah. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Um, and the other, the other thing um, that Baby Friendly USA, they made a slight, uh, uh, clarification, I guess, um, in the 2016 guidelines, they did this last year, uh, so that because the actual uh, language as far as the guidelines for step nine, you know, nothing there changed. But when you look at kind of the, the bullet points of, well, if we interview 10 mothers, you know, 80% are going to say this or that, uh, be able to answer the questions. And they just, they clarified that if, um, a, uh, if, if they interview 10 mothers and um, you want eight of the 10 mothers, you know, to say, no, my baby didn't get a bottle of formula or what have you, or if they did, then they were educated about the impact of that decision and that was documented. That makes sense. So they clarified that it's not that you have to have 80% exclusive breastfeeding rate. You could have a 50% exclusive breastfeeding rate, and but the mother, you encouraged exclusive breastfeeding, you supported it, you educated her about you know, the impact um, that giving the bottle of formula can have. Uh, so they've clarified that piece. That's really the change they made. Um, where they kind of already had that language in there for pacifiers, but they didn't specifically have that in there for giving um, the bottles of, uh, yeah, a bottle of anything, express breast milk. Um, so um, anyway, anybody else questions or 
other comments on um, step nine? All right, I'm looking at our time here. Um, we're nearing the end anyway. Um, so uh, looking at step 10, um, what were some of the common barriers? Just, you know, we don't know what's out there. Lack of, you know, awareness of what resources, you know, we have in our particular community and, um, and lack of maybe proactive resources. Um, and maybe, you know, they feel like, you know, well, we can send them to WIC, but, you know, our WIC doesn't have breastfeeding peer counselors. So what's gonna be there, you know? Um, and anyway, knowing, you know, knowing what are those um, quality resources. So what are some of the strategies? Um, of course, uh, partnering um, with those community resources so that you can kind of strengthen um, and, you know, or do we have any kind of, you know, breastfeeding coalition? Of course, we have our state uh, coalition and more on that in a minute here, um, develop, you know, a good resource list and make sure all of your mothers get that. Um, if you have um, a local coalition, of course, our state coalition, um, you know, somebody, you know, can we do a needs assessment to identify um, what are some of these uh, support needs that we may have? Um, of course, that to me, that's kind of a, a biggie. Well, you might do a needs assessment and then what? <laughs> Who has funding perhaps to, you uh, address what you come up with. Um, but then this one was good. I thought strategize um, through collaborating uh, with those community partners. And they gave some specific examples like, you know, how many of you have uh, any kind of community partner on your task force? Do you have a local well group or a WIC uh, a peer counselor um, that could come to your task force? You know, or would they want to hold a support group you know, if you provided a, a meeting space in your facility so you can kind of make those kinds of connections. Um, uh, or use, they said, utilize marketing follow-up calls. I think of those as like what many hospitals do now as a discharge um, uh, or follow-up phone call after discharge uh, and, you know, ask if moms, you know, got connected with uh, appropriate resources. And then, um, you know, offer resources where mothers are likely to be found. Of course, you know, what are your pediatric providers? Do they have information on the breastfeeding hotline, for example? Or, or that if you're an integrous facility that does a milk bar, do your pediatric providers, you know, have that information too? So, um, and, uh, of course, our uh, exciting news is um, our Oklahoma breastfeeding hotline is Petra has been working hard on this for some time now, more than a year, yeah. uh, more than a year at least. Um, so this will be a huge change to our hotline, but starting next month, uh, we will have a texting capability. So moms will still have the ability to utilize the hotline as they always have, as the, you know, leave a number and we will call you back or tell us it's an urgent call and we will call you right back. Uh, or, um, you know, they'll have in the void, in the greeting, you know, if you prefer um, us to text you, then text OK2BF to 61222, and they'll start the conversation through um, an online a secure portal where they can um, uh, text and get some and try to help the mothers um, initially that way. So the phone piece will always be available, but this new texting piece um, will start next month. So we'll have to work on yeah, redesigning. <laughs> I'm looking at Sarah here too. Redesigning our uh, handout that we have online, so we can add that um, piece to it. Yeah, so piece. That anybody can join. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. Anybody that calls the hotline, um, that's kind of our soft launch. Um, we have some other ideas on this um, down the road, but we're first just making sure that we'll have that ability for anybody who makes their initial contact with the hotline by calling it, um, as they always have. Anyway, so last but not least, um, anyone else um, uh, for addressing um, step 10 as far as support um, uh, after discharge? I know we've got uh, Vicki, well, Vicki's still on here, I'm in Integris Hospitals that have started their own uh, support groups um, that the moms can come the milk bars. Of course, our hotline. And then um, I have the, um, uh, one uh, flyer we have on our website that um, has resources, you know, 
hotline WIC, and it's got stuff on the back page too, um, and you know what are some support groups and so forth. But um, COBA, the COBA website has um, a lot of good information on there as well. So um, I'm not hearing anybody yet jump in. So anyway, I'm looking at our time and um, just another minute or two. So just a last uh, two or three slides here, just a reminder of our um, new website uh, and new address, obrc.ouhsc, where's my mouse, edu. So if you haven't visited our um, redesigned, thanks to Sarah, uh, website, please uh, yeah, check that out. Uh, as always, we have trainings coming up. I'll be in Tulsa next week to do a two-day training. We have the Making Breastfeeding Easier, um, the last um, scheduled ones for the fiscal year, but of course, uh, any hospitals can always schedule that um, at their facility as well. And then our 15-hour online training um, is, is once again always available. So uh, COBA, just a couple of quick things. COBA's summer general meeting will be that first Saturday in August, of course, during a World Breastfeeding Week and National Breastfeeding Month. So stay tuned as uh, COBA sorts out uh, what fun thing they want to do on that day. And if you haven't been to the website or to the new, um, where's my mouse now, here we go, uh, events calendar, if you have any kind of breastfeeding related event, you can email info at OK Breastfeeding and um, get your uh, um, event put on the COBA calendar there too. So a um, couple of save the dates, we have our uh, baby friendly summit next year scheduled and then uh, of course coming up in September is um, preparing for a lifetime's 10th anniversary summit partnering with OPQI um, on a, really a, a big day there too so my final slide I'm going to leave y'all to remember if you haven't done the CDC MPINK survey so you have that information in front of you but um, otherwise I think we are ready to call this a wrap unless anybody has any other um, questions or comments. Hey, Becky, it's Charlie again. Um, we submitted ours, but we've not gotten our results back. Yeah, no, no one would get results back. Uh, okay. so this is just still making sure that they get enough surveys submitted. Um, and so, uh, so it's still out in the field. And it, it will probably be goodness, this is June, um, you know, because they'll, they'll need, and since this is like a new version, they had in pink in the, the first round for about 10 years and they made some changes to it. Uh, so I'm not sure how long it will take them to analyze, you know, and publish results. If they get them out, you know, by the end of the calendar year, that would probably be pretty optimistic. Um, so, uh, I know they'll be trying, probably trying to do that, but no one would have gotten their survey results yet. It's just making sure that they're getting enough surveys submitted by hospitals. Because um, they usually had a really good response rate to this and it was just quite a struggle um, this year or this, this time around with the changes they made. So um, anyway, all right, any other questions from anybody? I should have asked if everybody, if everybody that's on the call today knows if their hospital submitted their survey. So, uh, you know, we've heard from some people. Let's see if I had any other. Yeah, Christy had to leave, so that's okay. Um, all right. Well, I think. Um, I think we will. Um, yeah, call this a wrap. And as always, y'all know how to get hold of us. So if any questions or anything in the meantime, feel free to uh, yeah, email me or OBRC and we'll do what we can to help. So thanks for joining in. There's in. Oh, stop.